Welcome back to a new episode of Digital Business Models Podcast by 4Week MBA. In this session, I interview Federico Fargin, one of the founding fathers of Silicon Valley. He is the author of Silicon, from the invention of the microprocessor to the new science of consciousness. Federico actually led a project in the early 70s at Intel that would change and open up the whole PC industry as we know it today. He actually designed a chip, especially in 1974, called the 8080, which was a game changer. I remember reading the first time the name of Federico when I was reading in 2012 the memoir by Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, and he explained how this design by Federico Vagin actually made the whole industry possible. I remember that with PC, the whole software industry became viable in the first place. So this was really a turning point in the history of Silicon Valley. With Federico, we reconstruct the history of the microprocessor, the role that he played, and how it actually was the, the leading component for this technological revolution. We also go through his uh, story of how, when he left Intel, he founded other companies, from Zilog to Synaptics, and he would end up working on other technological projects that managed to change whole industries. Also, uh, later on, he jumped on the topic of consciousness, and he did that as uh, someone who had worked for years on the transistor, who, let's remember, uh, as uh, dynamics uh, that uh, work based on quantum physics. So he understands the logic of quantum physics and interaction between quantum and classical physics, and he explains to us what's the difference between a human and a machine, what makes humans humans, actually it's consciousness, as we'll see, and why, when we actually talk about AI, we need to be careful, and we'll see all of those things in this session. Uh, Federico, thank you for joining this conversation. It's uh, an honor to, to have you here. Grazie Gennaro, thank you Gennaro. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. I, uh, actually, to, to get uh, this conversation started, and there are many things that uh, I'd like to cover because your story, it's so interesting because it crossed a few industries uh, that uh, changed, uh, the, the, let's say, our, the business world in the last uh, uh, decades. But uh, the, the first time I heard your name, just uh, for a bit of context, it was in 2012. I remember I was reading uh, the, the book from um, the Microsoft uh, co-founder, Paul Allen, and not everyone knows him, but pretty much I remember that uh, this book was published in, in 2012. At the time, I was living in, in San Diego, in California, but pretty much I was reading this book, uh, which is a memoir by, uh, by Paul Allen. And in introduction, actually, he mentioned how uh, the, the project that you were working on back in the days, it was 1974, the, the, the um, 8080 would actually, the 8080 chip, which we'll see throughout this conversation, actually changed and created the whole industry. And it created actually, it created the context for companies like Microsoft to thrive in the first place. But before we get to that, how did you, how did you get in the first place to uh, toward uh, engineering and, and computers when you were uh, you know, a, a young boy? <laughs> Well, I was uh, I was born and raised in Vicenza, uh, in Italy, in uh, the northeast of Italy, and uh, since I remember, my interest was uh, in airplanes and how machine works, cars and trucks, what have you. Uh, you know, as I was uh, a, a small boy, and. Uh, uh, and then later, I got interested in computers uh, when I was studying electronics at uh, the Istituto Tecnico Rossi uh, di Vicenza, of Vicenza uh, which is a technical high school uh, where many uh, do engineering, the beginning of engineering there. Uh, and then I ended up working with Olivetti in 1960s and 1961. So I was 18 and, eight, and 19 uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. And I had the privilege, I would say, to uh, run a project where a small electronic computer was built using transistors. In those days, uh, transistors were still a novelty. I never studied them in school. I had to learn them uh, working on it. Mm -hmm. And it was through this project where I designed uh, about 60% of a 
experimental computer and built it with four technicians that worked for me. Uh, uh, that uh, I, I decided that I wanted to go back and study solid state physics because I was intrigued by transistors. How do they work? I mean, uh, clearly they don't work using the conventional classical physics that we study. I never studied quantum physics. And uh, in those days, uh, probably even today in uh, the high schools, you don't study quantum physics. And so I wanted to understand. And uh, that was what brought me to solid state physics. Uh, after the uh, graduated uh, in University of Padua, I work for SGS uh, Fairchild, which now is ST Micro. And uh, there I developed the first MOS technology for ST Micro using metal gate. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I was sent to the US for what was supposed to be six months as an exchange between engineers at working for Fairchild, which was the, the company that invented the integrated circuits. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was there that I came up with the ideas and developed uh, the silicon gate technology, which was the technology to make integrated circuits uh, that were much better than before. And they eventually became the main technology for pretty much all of the integrated circuits built in the world uh, until recently uh, you know now the the new technology use more sophisticated technology but but for 40 45 years silicon gate technology was the technology to make uh, to make integrated circuits and it was the technology that made possible the non-volatile memories the microprocessors the dynamic memories the ccd imagers pretty much all the key components of today's technology was made with that so that was 1968 and then in 1970, I joined Intel, and that's when I designed the world's first microprocessor that was made possible with the silicon gate technology. It was, that was the 4004, 4-bit microprocessor. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, uh, for, for a, little bit, a little bit of context to the, the audience on the other side, when you were... Uh, when you had this experience at the Olivetti in the, in the 60s, actually Olivetti was a, uh, was a computer, uh, was one of the, the first companies that managed to build uh, the, the, the first uh, programmable computer, as we'll see throughout this conversation. But it was also like uh, an Italian um, a co a computing a giant computer company. And uh, it, it is also worth highlighting that uh, you mentioned a few companies which history is critical because uh, in this, uh, uh, in this actually, series i also uh, interviewed uh, the the author of uh, a book which is called the idea factory and this is the story of uh, bell labs and actually before we got uh, to to uh, fairchild uh, semiconductors who as you said was uh, was a company opened the market as uh, you know was uh, was a main uh, player in the in the uh, transistor space. Actually, uh, before that, uh, we had uh, one of the, the, the main geniuses at Bell Labs was uh, William Shockley, who, who built uh, what's called what was called the uh, Shockley Semiconductor because he left the Bell Labs uh, in the 50s and he created his own company. Uh, we can say that he was one of the first uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneur because he moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. And this, this, is, this is a critical step. Now, Shockley Semiconductor, just you know, for additional context to, to the audience, actually failed uh, miserably after a few years, I think in the uh, 1960. But at the same time, it, has, it had assembled a team of very uh, smart, smart people. And among them, of course, uh, there, was, um, there was Gordon Moore, uh, would uh, go on to, to found uh, within the group that actually later on uh, created a Fairchild and also Intel, which you later on uh, worked. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is pretty interesting because uh, that's how we can trace the, route, the, the, the roots of, of uh, Silicon Valley. But uh, on, on your end, um, when you actually started to work at Intel, it's pretty interesting because there are many interesting aspects that you mentioned in a book. Like, for instance, how this was a, side, a sort of side project for Intel. Uh, the, the, um, the, you know, the, the microprocessor was not the main business of the company. And actually, for a few years, you had to work very hard to convince them to focus on that business. How did it go? I mean, what were some of the discoveries that made, uh, in the first place, the, the 4004 uh, a chip possible? And uh, how was your story there in, the, in those early days? Well, the, the, um, 
you know, in the late 60s, uh, it was clear that MOS technology <clears throat> was the only technology that could potentially uh, integrate eventually in the far future in those days it was, it was thought a, a, a CPU on a chip. A CPU on a chip was sort of, you know, but there, there were few of us that, that thought that that could be possible. But the technology uh, in 68, when I joined Intel, the metal gate and MOS technology was too slow and, and was not uh, it was not dense enough. Uh, you could only integrate uh, at best half of the number of transistors that, that were required to make a CPU uh, of a small, a small CPU. Uh, uh, but even worse, it would have been too slow. It was five times slower than you needed to have a useful CPU because you know you need about 10 microsecond instruction cycle if you want to do anything useful with a microprocessor mm -hmm. and uh, with a small CPU, irrespective of, of how much it costs. So the uh, you know it was the silicon gate technology that that achieved those two fundamental tasks speed and density uh, and that was my work at Fairchild and Intel understood that uh, I mean the founders of Intel came from Fairchild where I was working in fact my boss was was one of the first employees of uh, of Intel and and uh, Gordon Moore was the head of the lab where I, uh, I developed this technology. So they knew that this was a fundamental new step and they basically decided to start their own company, taking that technology with them. Uh, so when I joined uh, uh, Intel, uh, my, my job, my, what, what I wanted, I wanted to, uh, to uh, create the most advanced integrated circuit possible. And the reason at that time was not so much that I wanted to make a microprocessor, but I wanted to show that the silicon gate technology was the technology of the future. And uh, uh, Fairchild did not uh, adopt the silicon gate technology immediately because uh, we couldn't do the bootstrap loads with, uh, with silicon gate, which was a, an important circuit, the circuit that was necessary for the way that logic circuits were done in those days. And it was only after another year of work that I figured out how to do it. So, so Intel, when Intel was formed, they didn't know that you could do the bootstrap load either. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and their, their task was to do memories, which could be made with Silicon Gate uh, in those days, but uh, not, 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 not much, much more. And, uh, and so when I decided to leave it was the time when I had developed the, the bootstrap load and I wanted to now make the most complex circuits possible. And it was at Intel that they had already a, a custom project going, but they didn't know how to do it. So it just happened to, you know, to end in my lap, so to speak. And I had the technology to do it, which was the silicon gate with the bootstrap load and with the buried contact, which is a way to make direct contact between the polysilicon and the junctions so that uh, you could make very dense uh, uh, random logic integrated circuits. So that was that was the story. So I did not I did not go to Intel with the idea of making a microprocessor, though the idea was already in the air. I mean, there were people that had already made uh, CPUs with a number of chips. But if you make CPUs with a number of chips, uh, they are they are too slow. And, uh, you know, or if, if you want to make them fast, you have to use a lot of power. And so that can be done uh, only if you, you know, if you make special circuits, you know, systems for, you know, for military or military things or a computer for your own, you know, to, to sell the computer. In other words, you know, not for commercial application. So, so, um, uh, so. And the, and the customer was a Japanese, the customer of the first uh, microprocessor, in fact, it was a family of chips, was a Japanese customer. They wanted to make uh, a set of chips of which three chips were supposed to be a CPU. And, uh, and uh, at Intel, uh, uh, the, the, the head of the application group saw an opportunity to actually, using Silicon Gate, to actually Combine those three chips into you know into a single one by uh, by using random access memory instead of uh, 
instead of uh, um, serial memory, which was the memory used in those days. There was no, no dynamic, dynamic RAM in those days. Intel was just beginning to develop those. And so, so everything was ready for me to actually do the microprocessor. So when, when, I, when I joined, Intel was already six months late because they, couldn't, they didn't know how to do it. So the, this, the project was sitting there. I picked up the project. And then uh, nine months later, we had a microprocessor and the other three chips. They were the ROM, RAM, and the I.O. Yeah, and uh, as you also explain in, uh, in, in your book, uh, actually, uh, this is a point that uh, I would like to, to emphasize a bit. Uh, this was not the direction toward which uh, Intel was <laughs> going, right? I mean... Uh, no, no, it, uh, this was an opportunistic project. Right. Intel wanted to make memories. They have identified properly so that, that uh, the um, magnetic core memories, which were the way memories were made in those days for large computers and also for mini computers, uh, were too expensive and, and, uh, and too slow. And, this, and the technology, the MOS technology was really uh, ready to overtake uh, that technology. And so they had picked their sight on that market. And, uh, and it was only because it took a while for the, their early memory chips to be adopted that they needed to, you know, to have some other business. And they, they took on some custom projects Mm -hmm. And uh, one was the 4004, the other one was the 8008 that I also did. Uh, and the 8080, which was, also my, was a, my idea, and I also did, which was the microprocessor that opened up the floodgates of the, of the uh, personal computer. So, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Paul Allen earlier, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the 8080 was my project in 73 and it was ready in 74. Yeah, and uh, you know, just for a little bit of context to the audience, the eighty-eight wasn't just a, a you know a little improvement on the previous uh, chips. It was like a huge leap forward, right? Yeah, it was six times faster than the eight thousand and eight because in in those days, Intel had this uh, you know this idea that they had to use only uh, packages of uh, sixteen pins or eighteen pins, which was frankly crazy, but uh, that's the <laughs> that's what they thought. And it took me a while to convince my, my boss to, to, first of all, I came up with the architecture of the 8080, which was a big improvement over the 8008. And, uh, uh, and uh, a, diff a different architecture that would they use 40 pins that would allow to really get the speed that was necessary. So we went from 12 microsecond access time to two microsecond mm -hmm. access time for the 8080. And that was enough to make a personal computer. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, going uh, a few steps backward, and uh, just again to to give the audience uh, a full timeline, and then we move forward. Uh, when when the the, fir the first transistor was actually uh, you know uh, invented, I guess at at Bell Labs. Uh, it was an interesting invention, but in reality, it wasn't. Uh, I guess there wasn't much that you could uh, do for uh, for computing uh, with, with that kind of transistor. So there were still many things that needed to be done. One of the main proponents of at Bell Labs of uh, transistors, of, co of course, was uh, William Shockley, as we said. Shockley uh, left Bell Labs, created uh, the, the Shockley semiconductors, which actually assembled uh, a, a team of very smart people, among which uh, the people that would create. The, the next wave of, uh, of um, giants in the, in the uh, microprocessing industry. But the interesting <laughs> part is that uh, um, also Shockley was uh, hooked, as uh, we saw also in the episode that related to Bell Labs. Uh, it was actually, uh, mm, he, he thought that uh, the, the, um, the technology that would have changed the industry would be like the, the one uh, connected to the germanium. But um, as you actually explain also in the book, the real uh, jump forward was made uh, when uh, the, the Silicon Gate technology uh, came, uh, came to life. Yeah. And uh, so from, from there, we see the, the birth of, uh, of a few companies from, as, as we said, from Fairchild to Intel, and then going forward to other companies like IBM, Compaq, Microsoft, which uh, gave rise to the next wave of develop, uh, development of PCs which uh, uh, you know would come to the masses together of course with Apple and uh, going forward to the internet and all the other waves that we're living today. So uh, sorry for, for going back again, but I think it's very important to stress how important uh, the, 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 this moment was uh, from an historic uh, standpoint. Uh, and then you left uh, Intel. Uh, of course, um, 
what happened there? Like, why did you eventually leave the company? Uh, what did you do next? Well, uh, you know, just to to complete the discussion that you started, yep. you know, uh, the the first transistor was a point junction transistor, so point contact transistor. Sorry, there was, uh, you know, it was pretty pretty useless, but but it was a proof of concept. And it was done in 1940, in 1947. So, mm -hmm. so and it was Shockley, one of the co-inventors, and also you know Nobel Prize winner, together with the other two, Bardeen and Bratton. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, but then it took another five years before the first junction transistor using germanium, which was the same material of the original transistor, mm -hmm. uh, came to market. And those were the diffusion transistor. Uh, but germanium was too slow and also suffer from thermal runaway. So, you know, especially power transistors could could basically burn themselves up if you were if we are not designed properly and properly ventilated. Mm -hmm. So so it, it was really a technology looking for a better way of doing it. And it was really with the with the silicon transistor, which was essentially developed by Fairchild, Shockley did not do that. Mm -hmm. Shockley started the, you know, started in that direction, but uh, but but uh, Shockley, Bill Shockley wanted to develop something closer to a thyristor, which was a, a different kind of transistor with negative uh, resistance. It was not a really a good idea, and so the uh, eight of the founders of the early engineers decided to leave and start Fairchild. Among them was Noyce and uh, Moore. And the less known uh, character, which was uh, Jean Erny, who invented the planner process, which was the real technology, the real invention that made possible uh, very low cost transistors and most importantly, integrated circuits. Because the planner technology allowed to make many transistors at one, at the same time on, a, on the surface of a silicon wafer. Mm -hmm. You know, so instead of making one transistor at a time, which was the way they were done in the past, you could make many. And then because they were one next to each other in this silicon wafer, you could connect them together. So it was, it was, that was the seminal invention and, and it is now told very well in the history. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean Elny, uh, you know, was a Swiss engineer, then he went his own way and, and he basically is kind of forgotten, but, uh, but really he's the guy that made this seminal invention that made the change the industry because integrated circuits, of course, made possible to make many transistors, connect them together at the same time. And eventually now we make, you know, tens of billions of transistors, even trillions of transistors in the uh, flash memories that you have in your pocket. You know, mm -hmm. one, one terabyte that you can buy is a chip that has more than one trillion transistors integrated, all silicon gate in this case, uh, in them. So my, my uh, you know, so the, this story sort of picks the poignant points. And, uh, and, and then the silicon gate technology was the technology uh, that, that with the idea of MOS, MOS transistors instead of bipolar transistors, which were, were all the early transistors, could move forward to a much better technology because it, it could be made smaller and smaller and smaller. Moore's law was fueled by the fact that, you, that, that these MOS devices were surface devices that they could shrunk in size. And as you shrunk the size, they were faster, cheaper, and also, uh, also um, you could put more on a, on a chip. And, and that was the 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 key the you know the key technology that moved forward for the, the following fifty years the industry. So to, back to Intel after yeah. the the eighty eighty, uh, I decided that uh, because Intel was you know they, they were a memory company they wanted to make microprocessors to sell memories they didn't see the potential of uh, microprocessors and. And you know, it took me nine months to convince my bosses to let me do the 8080, which was the product that really, you know, made a big turn in microprocessor because for the first time you could have two microsecond, you know, instruction cycle. Uh, they were, you know, they were close to mini computers at that point. Mini computers were around, uh, you know, one microsecond, half a microsecond instruction cycles in those days. So, so all of a sudden you have. You have a real step forward. And I decided to start my own company. So I started Zilog 
and Zilog developed the Z80. That was my other idea. Uh, and came out, the Z80 came out in, uh, in uh, 1976. That Z80 had, it was an improvement over much, much big improvement over the 8080. Uh, it, was a, it was a set of chips that, uh, with which you could build very powerful uh, personal computers and computers systems and control systems uh, at one microsecond access time as they came out and they, you know, you could do, you could do better later on. But, but you know, that, the, the Z80 actually was a very powerful microprocessor. It's still in volume production today, by the way, <laughs> 45 years later. So, so, so uh, it, 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 is, uh, it is one of the, you know, it is like a Volkswagen <laughs> that, that had a long, a long life. So, so that was my next uh, move was to start uh, my first company. And so I, I moved from a engineering, essentially, you know, uh, to entrepreneurship. I became a, an entrepreneur, and uh, the rest of my business life was uh, was as an entrepreneur. Hmm. A couple of points which would be nice to to touch. Um, first, why do you think it took so long for for Intel? to actually realize the potential of, uh, of the, the microprocessor the, the microprocessor and I guess uh, it was uh, also um, more like of a, of a business um, you know issue where they were focused on uh, uh, where the revenue was uh, so not able to really make a shift toward a very innovative direction. Well you know it took, it took a while for the mm -hmm. microprocessor to reach uh, the, the business level that, that that memories were, you know, because memories became uh, dynamic memories became highly successful, and uh, and so the business of dynamic memories was uh, was much bigger than the business of microprocessor early on, and it was really uh, it was really because of IBM that mm -hmm. Intel then decided to change course. Actually, two reasons: IBM, the fact that IBM adopted the AD eighty six. Of Intel or 8088, uh, which is a version of the 8086, uh, but also even more importantly, because the Japanese uh, develop uh, dynamic memories that were much more reliable than the American uh, manufacturers, and the Japanese started taking over the market, uh, and Intel was in real in real trouble. If Intel did not have microprocessor in those days, I'm mm. speaking about 80, 83, 84, uh, Intel would have probably, you know, fail. My, you know, uh, for example, um, Mostec, which was a, you know, a major producer in those days of uh, dynamic memories, uh, actually failed. It was a company that was doing very well, but, uh, you know, they could not, uh, overcome the, the competition of the Japanese and basically the company failed. The company simply, you know, uh, went, went, <laughs> went, down, went, went down. So uh, at Intel in, in 84, they had, they, they had to make the decision that uh, they had to concentrate on microprocessor uh, because they were losing their shirt on, on dynamic memories. And, and uh, so they were lucky that uh, IBM had adopted them as you remember the, mm -hmm. C was uh, 1981, so the, BC, the PC was really a major development in the informational industry, like the you know like the the, um, the silicon Valley technology was for the industry because it it changed the course of the, of the industry, and uh, and the the IBM invent you know, the IBM development of the personal computer was uh, was what uh, changed the, the history of, uh, of, of, of even, the, of, even of, the, of the personal computer. It wasn't Apple that did it at that time. It was really IBM. Their adoption changed the landscape and, and the personal computer became a business tool in addition to a consumer good. Uh, and it was uh, then Intel, uh, their leadership that run, the, you know, run as fast as they could to keep the competition for catching up with them uh, and drove the industry for the following 25, 30 years. Hmm. Uh, so so that, that's, the, that, that, that's what happened. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, and it was only, you know, Apple in fact was uh, almost, you know, done if it wasn't because uh, Steve Jobs, you know, went back to Apple and uh, his vision was so powerful that it basically it changed the industry again. 
but it was not in the PC that, that Apple changed the industry. It was in the iPhone, the iPod first, and the iPhone, and then of course uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, their PC success is a consequence of having regained leadership in a new market uh, in a, in a different ways that uh, that any other PC manufacturer did because uh, you know as you know now uh, Apple even makes their own microprocessors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, but but IBM IBM was the one that carried the day, so to speak. IBM and uh, you know and and the clone manufacturers of IBM computers uh, carried the day for you know for the following uh, 20, 20 years. You know from the early eighties until until the uh, you know early two thousand. Yeah, so it, it took uh, like uh, a decade almost to Intel to to understand that they needed to jump on the other. Uh, microprocessor market and as you said it, it took a lot of foresight to do to do it before because the memory market was much larger and uh, when it comes to a future market it's very hard to understand how big it's going to be so it's it's a huge bet. so it's also understandable that it's not easy to to predict how big a market is going to be just a few people as you said like like steve B jobs with with a uh, huge vision uh, managed to create those new industries that uh, turned out to be much larger than the previous ones. So yeah. uh, that's uh, that, that's not an easy one of the hardest thing of business, I guess. It's really to develop a whole market from scratch. This is probably one of the, the hardest challenges for for anyone who is, who is doing business. Also, because as you point out in the book, in many cases. When it comes to new technologies, it's not just the single technology itself, but the whole ecosystem that needs to develop around the that's technology. Right. So uh, that's uh, that's a huge, huge component. And uh, also another point which I think it makes uh, sense to emphasize is also the fact that, uh, as you mentioned, IBM uh, opened a um, whole new uh, industry and uh, it created a, a, a whole new set of players also because uh, IBM went for uh, an, uh, an open system, which, uh, which was something uh, completely di different than uh, uh, what the company had done in the past, right? I mean, they-, yeah. they <clears throat> it, it was unexpected mm -hmm. and, and, and frankly uh, surprised everybody because, uh, because uh, that was the opposite of what, of what IBM, not, not, not just another way, the opposite of what IBM always did, which was to control every piece of their technology, including making transistors and integrated circuits. Uh, they, you know, in those days, IBM was the largest producer of integrated circuits in the world. They hmm. were all used to make their own computers. IBM was a giant, and they basically they almost they almost committed harakiri with their decision. Hmm. And, and it was because they, they did not understand the phenomenon that was just developing under their eyes. The personal computer took over the industry. But it, and, and it was because the, the technology behind, which is the technology, uh, the semiconductor technology, could make an enormous progress, you know, basically ev doubling every two years. You know, after, after a few years, doubling every two years makes a big difference, <laughs> as you know. So yeah. you know, uh, you know, uh, nobody in those days could, you know, uh, and say in early '80s, nobody thought that, you know, this uh, Moore's law, so-called Moore's law, because you know, it's mm. just, a, you know, it's just an observation. Yeah. Uh, because the real, the real law is the is the law of of uh, Deming. That, you know that that basically, uh, basically, you you can scale you can scale the the transistors and, and, and make it smaller and smaller and smaller. And, uh, and that, you know, uh, and that, that could last so long. I mean, basically, we, we didn't think that, that we could go to three nanometers. I mean, it would, it, you know, just today, it's, it's crazy to think that you can make transistors that have a critical dimension of three nanometers. You know, that's, uh, that's you know, it's, it's just uh, 10 transistors, 10, 10 atoms next to each other is 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 you know is an is a nanometer i mean it's amazing yeah that, that's uh, extremely important to keep in mind when new technologies are developing in the early days uh, you know, and the, the way this technology could uh, build up over time might seem impossible but uh, uh, they tend to to really align around the very strong incentives 
Um, also, uh, of course, uh, as you said, IBM uh, almost uh, killed uh, itself in the long run, even though probably they didn't understand it at the time, but it was eventually good for the industry because many other players came about. So definitely overall, it was uh, great for the industry. And another uh, thing which I remember reading somewhere a few years back, uh, actually, I think there was also a uh, uh, first antitrust case uh, in, uh, in uh, 69 uh, against uh, IBM, which might have uh, also pushed the company um, toward having uh, an open approach. So like uh, it wasn't just, I think, uh, they were blind. I think they were also trying to avoid them. Um, you know, anti anti monopoly uh, or antitrust uh, cases against them. So it may be that in some, you know, in, in this circumstance, it may be that IBM was also a bit threatened by the the uh, the uh, regulators, and so this fear may be that it made them completely change direction. Because if they were, no, I, I don't think so, Gennaro. Because okay. no, because because it, it was because they, you know, they couldn't do all the pieces that were needed, so they. They decided to go, you know, to go, for example, get soft, you know, get an operating system that probably 10 guys in their shop would have done in six months, you know, if they if they understood what they were getting into. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, but, you know, they, they, you know, they were in a hurry, they wanted to come out with a product and mm -hmm. the product was done outside, outside the sort of the watch of the divisions because it was done as a skunk works in, you know, in Florida. And uh, uh, you know, under the tutelage of the CEO at that time, it mm -hmm. was just that it went out of hand, and they, they didn't realize. And of course, the, the people that they dealt with, like uh, Microsoft, for example, Microsoft uh, did not want to give them the exclusivity. You know, and 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 uh, it was you know, I mean, most companies would have given them the exclusivity, and and therefore you know they would not have gotten themselves into this problem. But they accepted the conditions of Microsoft and that actually allowed every other company, you know, they wanted to, to, you know, to be in that business to have access to the software base, which was the real riches. Hmm. And so, you know, so that's how it worked. Interesting. So there was really a huge, huge oversight. Yeah. No, no, it, it, because, you know, nobody, you know, nobody could accuse IBM if they had made their own operating system or their own microprocessor that, that uh, there was anything, you know, anything uh, to do with, uh, you know, with, uh, <laughs> you know, with not being open, you know, in the industry. It was it's, it's what anybody would do in those days, would have done those days. It was just a, you know, it, it just, they just didn't understand what was, what they got into. Yeah, and most probably they also thought that this was still like a hardware uh, game, not really a software. Uh, uh, absolutely, side. absolutely, and and because in those days software was not a business to speak of, as a, as a software business. I mean, it was more of a custom thing, or you do your own, and that's about it. There was not a market for software, so I mean, it was it was a complete revolution that that caught by surprise even the ones that should not have been caught by surprise. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Yeah, and on your side, uh, how did it go after Intel? Because uh, you uh, started a journey of becoming like a serial entrepreneur. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of uh, the, the the companies that you founded after after Intel? Well, I founded uh, Zilog, and uh, Zilog uh, was quite successful from the, you know, in the in the early early years. And uh, uh, but but uh, the only the only um, uh, the only venture capital that I found in 1975 was uh, was Exxon because there was no money in VC that year. That year was unbelievably unbelievable. It's, it's, it's a, the low ever in the industry. Uh, the There were only $10 million of VC wow. invested wow. in 1975. <laughs> now, now, of course, uh, but even 10 years later, it was just one company, one startup company would get $10 million. But you know, so so we we started I started Synaptics with 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 half a million dollar, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and uh, and the only the only uh, financiers that we could find was Exxon Enterprises that in those days was uh, uh, was doing that that work, uh, but they they had a hidden agenda, and uh, I didn't see it um, early on, and, uh, and 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 so we found ourselves. Competing with IBM, uh, essentially, uh, you know, with in the PC business, and that's that's how 
the decision was made by IBM to not to use Zilog products because the Zilog products were better than Intel. Uh, but uh, but you know so so basically Zilog was uh, was uh, after the after the IBM decision was became an also ran their Z8000, which was a much better processor than uh, the 8086. Uh, basically was not adopted widely as the 8086 uh, and that was uh, that was really what uh, but you know i didn't know that when i left because i left uh, in 1980 at the end of 1980 i left uh, 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 zilog uh, and uh, uh, because i you know because i i just did not want to be a division of uh, of, of of exxon uh, and so that was not what I had started the company for. I didn't want that, and uh, and I decided to to change to change the road. Um, so then I, I started a company that developed uh, the first voice and data workstation, uh, uh, which was uh, unfortunately was not successful. Though the product was really amazing, I really you know it was an unbelievable product. He opened. He, he made people understand what it means to integrate voice and data into a single unit and uh, uh, I, I, I know that that uh, um, that uh, uh, in, in, a, in a very clear way uh, Steve Jobs was was uh, uh, was was really amazed by that product because uh, he told me so um, and uh, in, in some way the that product became the iPhone 20 years later <laughs> wow. Actually, yeah so uh, you know, but, but it, it was really that kind of product. And, uh, but of course, with the technology that was, uh, you know, they couldn't do the many things that the iPhone did. Uh, and then I started Synaptics, uh, where I worked with uh, neural networks early on when uh, people thought the neural networks, the people that thought they knew about, about artificial intelligence, uh, thought that neural networks were a bad idea. But in fact, uh, they were the, the right idea because uh, now AI works because neural networks work. And yeah. so, so I worked with those for a while, and then, uh, but it was too early. And so I decided to, to, that it was time to come up with a product. Otherwise, uh, the company would not have succeeded. And so we invented the touchpad and, and the touch screen, which you know, changed the way we do we interface with our computers so that the company is now a major company uh, still in you know one of the major suppliers for uh, touchpad and touch screens in the world um, and then uh, then i ran a company uh, that was started by uh, by um, synaptic and national and and carver mead and uh, uh, there was uh, foveon uh, making making uh, new imagers a special imagers with a new technology, which uh, that company was then sold uh, to a Japanese company. And then uh, I, about 12 years ago, I decided that uh, I had enough of business and I wanted to dedicate myself to the study of consciousness, the study of uh, what makes us different, make us different than machines. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and that was something that started, you know, my interest there started when I was uh, working with neural networks and studying neuroscience back in the uh, late 80s. Uh, um, and uh, and uh, that is uh, my current work and my current passion and uh, also my current contributions because uh, for the first time we have a theory of consciousness that, uh, that makes sense. In fact, it's the first theory of consciousness instead of being just talk about consciousness is is a real theory developed with a with a uh, one of the top physicists in the world in the area of quantum computation quantum quantum information. Yeah, yeah. And before we jump to that, because uh, finally, finally, you uh, you know your 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 work it's uh, extremely valuable. Uh, the work toward the creating a, a scientific theory of consciousness, especially where uh, many uh, scientists have uh, neglected it over the years, and, or at least they have uh, built a materialistic, as we'll see, um, you know, a version of it. But anyhow, um, before we, we jump to that, uh, what, what were some of the, the lessons that you learned uh, when you transitioned from, uh, from you know, being a, an engineer and a, and a physicist to becoming an entrepreneur? Well, the, 
um, the the I think that that the biggest thing for me was uh, uh, realizing that science cannot solve the problems that a, an entrepreneur can solve. Of course, it can, it can, it can help, but basically you, you know, an entrepreneur has to figure out how things are going to be two or three or four or five years from now when you make a decision of what product to make, for example. You have to figure out what product the competition might develop that could compete with your product. So those are all impossible to solve problems. You know, when you start, when you solve, when you develop a, a product, you have a technical problem and those technical problems uh, can be solved with the technology and the science that you know, that is known. Uh, if not, you probably wouldn't even think of doing it. Uh, and so, so, so all the, you know, all, all the answers you are under your capacity, but when you have to figure out the way the market will be five years from now, you cannot do that. And, and that's where I had to rely more and more on, on intuition. I found that I had a good intuition, but I had neglected to, to uh, pay attention to my intuition in the past though it served me well also to give me ideas or many inventions that they came through my intuitive channel. Uh, but, you know, with, when you had to, you know, to run a company, uh, intuition is even more important uh, because uh, you had to do many things that you never did before and never even thought before. And, uh, and, for, and that was intoxicating almost, you know, it was great. I mean, I, I loved it, even if it was, uh, uh, quite stressful at time because uh, if you don't know how you're going to pay your employees, <laughs> very painful. <laughs> if you don't have any money, you know that's not a that's not a fun place to be. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I never found myself to you know I found myself close to that, but not you know, but never where I had to sell my home to do that. So, <laughs> but I but 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 you know, I I I would say that the. The job of uh, running companies, starting companies and running companies, uh, was a, com a complementary to my technical ability. In fact, he used my technical ability, but but he developed parts of me that I didn't know I had. Uh, I call him the belly part, you know, the courage, taking risks, you know, doing things uh, that you don't know whether they are going to work or not, and generally being successful at that. So. So um, I grew up a lot through that process. And uh, I look at life as, a, as an opportunity for growth more than an opportunity to make money. And so for me, uh, being an entrepreneur for 30, 40 years uh, has been uh, really lots of fun and lots of learning. Uh, and in fact, uh, that's what brought me to also open my heart which is not what you would expect from an entrepreneur, but that's what happened. And, that's, and that was the third piece that was missing. Uh, head, heart, and belly are the three parts of us that need to, you know, to come into harmony and develop so that we are full human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it's, uh, it's worth uh, highlighting how probably this, uh, as, as you said, this journey uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur helped you actually develop other parts that uh, went behind the logic as, as a physicist and as an engineer. And from there, actually, you developed a theory of consciousness, which I was very compelling to me, uh, first of all, because uh, it, it comes uh, from someone who has been a practitioner for many years, someone who has jumped to become an entrepreneur, and someone who actually understand the world of quantum physics, which it's worth remembering, it, it's, uh, uh, it is what uh, enabled the, the innovation of a microprocessor in the first place. And your point of view, it's so compelling because you say, you say uh, actually your approach, it, it's quite the opposite from traditional science of today where consciousness is more a byproduct of, of uh, random processes that happen in, in uh, let's say in the brain. Um, According to you, it's something completely different and it's something completely like much, much larger than the physical world. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about this discovery? How did you get there? Uh, what does that imply? Yeah, well, <clears throat> basically, 
um, the question of what is, first of all, what is consciousness and uh, where does it come from uh, is a question that science is really neglected. Uh, it's been mostly a philosophical question uh, or a religious question. But, but if we say just without re bringing religion into the before, just in terms of human thought, it really has been a philosophical issue for since, you know, since uh, people started writing about. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and so consciousness is the fact that we have an experience. We know because we experience through feelings and sensations. And so where are feelings and sensations coming from? Uh, nobody knows. And, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, nobody even tried to answer that for, for the longest time. It was only the success of materialism that started with the idea of explaining the, you know, the outer world, the world of objects that interact in space and time. That was the physics that wanted to understand that world. And the success of physics brought with it uh, more and more uh, a, a way of thinking uh, that uh, got to the point where people were thinking that, uh, well, consciousness has to, has to come out from, uh, has to emerge from the brain. The brain is a complex system, but that's not an explanation. As you know, if you want to explain consciousness, uh, you need to explain it uh, as a mechanism. You know, how, how, how can you get sensations and feelings out of electrical or biochemical signals? And nobody can do that. And in fact, it doesn't make any sense. If you start thinking about it, as I did starting about 35 years ago, uh, you know, how can I make a conscious computer? You cannot make a conscious computer because, because the, a, a computer is made of is deterministic. So it means that uh, you know, the next instruction is what follows the previous instruction as the program tells you what to do. So th there is nothing to be conscious about. Uh, consciousness actually is what makes, you know, what actually gives life or gives meaning to information. Information without consciousness would make no sense. If the world were a deterministic world, it would be exactly like a computer and information would make no sense because the next signal, the next instruction would simply follow the previous one. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the probability of that, that probability will be one. Therefore, the information carried by the previous state, by the next state is zero because the probability you know, because, because the probability is the log of the probability, the log of one over p, the probability. And so, if the probability is one, basically you have you have no information. Basically, there is no surprise. You know, the next the next state is going to be mm -hmm. deterministically determined by the previous state, and, and and consciousness is works because information is not zero. Information makes sense because it is never zero. Mm -hmm. It can be zero occasionally, but it, can, it, it is also some type of, you know, some information is there, but it makes sense only if you're conscious. And so information and consciousness, in other words, are two faces of the same coin. Uh, there would not be information if there were not consciousness. Uh, we would be machines and we would be running like machines in the dark without any kind of experience, any kind of feeling any kind of sensation. So if you start with that, then you say, okay, well, you know, look, uh, how come that quantum physics is probabilistic then? Quantum physics is describing a world made of probabilities. That's interesting because that sounds like they're describing information. And in fact, in this theory with Dariano, Professor Dariano, who is, uh, you know, Professor Dariano is a professor of, uh, of quantum physics and, and theoretical physics at the University of, is the head of the theoretical physics group at University of Pavia. And he, is, uh, he and his collaborators have developed a, uh, what is called OPT, Operational 
probabilistic theory, which is a new theory that derives quantum physics from purely informational postulates. So quantum physics is about quantum information. Mm -hmm. And six postulates show you that you can build quantum, you know, it's like Dirac equation, for example, out of these postulates, which are purely informational postulates. And, and, and so when I found this out, you know, six years ago, uh, you know, that was in line with what I thought, because I thought the conscious information were two aspects of the same thing. So I started, you know, I started, you know, uh, working with him and, you know, and, and getting close. And, and essentially, we developed this, this new theory, uh, which is a, a, is a panpsychist theory of both quant of both uh, uh, consciousness and of uh, uh, and of free will and uh, because uh, quantum physics is also compatible with free will so basically what it says is that a system a quantum system that is in a pure state which is a very distinct state but is a state that cannot be known from the outside because quantum information cannot be known from the outside. That's a property of quantum information of a pure state. You cannot know it. You, you can only, if you measure it, you cannot know some of it, but you cannot know that state. We said, okay, that state is a conscious state to the system that is in that state. That's a postulate. So it means that consciousness is the feeling or the knowing that a system that is in a, in a quantum state, in a definite state, but that cannot be known from the outside, it, but it can be known from the inside. And so that explains why we have an experience. You see, in other words, our experience is because we are, because our consciousness is a quantum system. It does not even exist in space and time. It exists in a vaster reality, mm -hmm. which is the reality from which there will be, according to physicists, the collapse of the wave function that shows some form of information, which is classical information, into the space-time from a world which is vaster that can only be expressed or, or you know, or described using uh, uh, using Hilbert space, which is a space of n dimension and very large number, uh, and each dimension is a is a complex number. So it's a very abstract mathematical space that describes states that have this property that can they cannot be copied. And exactly like my, my experience, my experience, I am the only one that can know my experience. I can tell you what I'm feeling, I can tell you what I'm thinking, but you cannot know my experience and I cannot know yours because Consciousness is the fact that we have an experience which is private, where classical information is a public information. You can take the information of a computer, you can copy it into another memory. So a computer can never be conscious because it has no privacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see? So, you know, so, so the, the, starting this way, you find that uh, you can explain all kinds of things they cannot be explained in any other way. And so it's a, another way of saying that consciousness and free will are fundamental. They're not, they don't come with the brain. They are the one that created the brain. They are the one that created the life that we live. So it is exactly the opposite of what science is saying. Science is saying that conscious emerges af after life, in fact, not even after life, after life is sufficiently complex to develop brains because they, he emerges from brains. But how can a brain made of, of, made of matter, which is unconscious, create consciousness? It's mm. incongruent to think that you can get something out of something that doesn't have it. It would be like saying that matter that has no charge or no quantum, you know, magnetic spin can create electromagnetic waves when you know these waves re requires that there be some fundamental properties in the elements of which all reality is made that has that property mm. which is of course the charge of electrons and the spin of electrons in other in other particles so so that's you know 
you know, the, the, there is no explanation. Science has no explanation today for the fact that consciousness exists. Yeah. And so now we have the first theory that tells you, you don't have to have any explanation. We can show you how consciousness creates matter. So we don't have to explain why matter exists because matter in conventional science is taken for a fact. Okay, let's take for a fact that there is consciousness and free will, which is consistent with quantum physics. And then we can show how matter emerges. Matter is simply the play of information of entities which are conscious that communicate with each other using symbols. So the symbols with which these entities communicate with each other are what we describe as matter in physics. So the dance of those symbols are the laws of physics. Hmm. Yeah, and this uh, actually requires a whole restructuring of the, the way, as you said, uh, the scientific approach looks at things, which is primarily a mechanicistic approach and uh, uh, an approach that looks at uh, external things as uh, it's uh, all uh, that uh, there is in the, in the, in the world. And, and this is, that's why it's such an interesting uh, you know, perspective. And as you explain also, um, these, uh, um, oh, even when like a machine, like let's say a quantum computer is driven by a quantum processes that still doesn't make the machine conscious, right? I mean, it's still a machine because it's still- and Basically, uh, basically a, quantum, a quantum computer, a quantum computer uh, performs uh, uh, transformation, which are is, they're called unitary transformations. Mm -hmm. Those unitary transformations uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, maintain. I mean, you could say that a, that a, that a quantum computer may be conscious, but it's not self-conscious. It's not, it, and it doesn't have free will because free will require and consciousness, the real consciousness that uh, that allows you to do things, knowing that it is you that is doing those things. Uh, in other words, is self the self-consciousness is something that goes beyond the simple awareness. You know, there is a, you know, in English, there is the word awareness, which is a, so a softer form of consciousness uh, because the consciousness will be like self-awareness. It's something deeper. In other words, it's conscious, it's, it's awareness that is aware of itself. It's aware of being aware. So that's, that's consciousness. And, and consciousness uh, uh, is, is something that, that, even a quantum computer cannot be. It may be aware, but not self-aware, uh, unless you know, unless you have a living system. But then, even a living system, the consciousness of a living system is a quantum system that is connected with the living system, which is a quantum classical system. Mm -hmm. So, a living system like you and I, you know, are quantum classical systems, not classical. They are not. We are not like computers. We are much much more sophisticated machines than computers, but we are still machines, but we are controlled by a conscious entity, which is who we really are, which is not the body. So our conscious is not in the body, just like when you, you know, drive a drone, you control a drone, your consciousness is not in the drone, uh, you know, uh, nor in the, you know, right. nor in the program of the drone. I mean, the drone is something that is controlled by you, and and but you are not, you are not in the drone. And in fact, even the you that controls the drone is another body, but is a quantum classical body instead of a classical body like the drone, uh, that is controlled by a quantum body, which is a real consciousness. So when when the body dies, we don't go anywhere. We are still where we are, which is in in this other reality, which is deeper than physical reality, which is today explained via the uh, Hilbert space, the, mm -hmm. the, the quantum, quantum systems in Hilbert space. Right. And this is also true when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence approaches, we try, which try to mimic the way we, we do things. Like, for instance, uh, I'm thinking about one-shot learning, which is uh, something that has become, uh, is becoming very popular now. So I guess it's the... Uh, still the machine uh, follows different uh, uh, different processes. Um, and uh, to close this up, uh, when what's your future objective on this uh, on this side? I mean, what uh, would you like uh, the world to see in the coming years and that, we, that you would be happy and say, you know, I, I made it? Yeah, what, what, what I would like uh, people to take seriously 
these ideas uh, because this idea will change our com would completely change our worldview. We today we are told that we are machines, and if we are machines, then we can be superseded by machines that are more intelligent than we are. Mm -hmm. So you know it is true that if we are machines, the machines could turn against us, but we are not machines. And so you know, but if we think that we are machines, we're going to behave like machines. And, and the, 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 you know we are in this we are caught in this mirage that we think that we are machines because it looks like that we are machines, but if we actually begin to think about experience who we are, learn about ourselves, quiet our mind, and figure it out, then we can find that we are, you know, much more than machines. In fact, living systems are much more than machines. We don't know how to build a living system. We do not know how to assemble a living system. We start with life, we screw around with it, and uh, you know, we get other life, but we cannot put together the pieces like we put together the pieces to build a computer. And, uh, and, and the fact is that uh, even, even living systems are not sophisticated enough to be conscious on their own. They need, but they, they can be connected with conscious beings so that they're like the drones that we are, they are connected with our body that behaves with the, like a classical computer when they talk to a, another computer, like a drone. And so, so you know, so th there, there, is, there is a three levels of reality. There is quantum reality. There is the quantum classical reality, which is the reality of our body that can be controlled by the quantum world. And then we can control classical systems like computers and drones. And so that's the way that reality works. And if, we, if you begin to think in those terms, then the, the universe has meaning and purpose, which is not what science is telling us today. And that's a big change of mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. End of heart. End of yeah. heart. Absolutely. You change, and especially this is a change that will make technology really enhance humanity rather than try to destroy it. So right. it's, it's extremely important. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Federico, for, for taking the time. It was really a pleasure, a huge honor. And thanks. Thanks again. Thank you, Gennaro. It's a pleasure for me too. Thank you.